So, Christopher Pine, thank you for coming on Lessons in Leadership. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tell us, um, how did you become Defence Minister? You really became Defence Industry Minister first. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Well, Malcolm Turnbull decided that um, we had a massive program of acquisitions, particularly shipbuilding, uh, and initially wanted to you know, call me the Minister for um, Munitions and Works and, and Shipbuilding, I think, in the old sort of uh, World War II vein. Uh, but he felt that we had this very big program of acquisition and that it was a job all of its own uh, and that we had to put in place the structures to give defence industry and defence a very clear guideline of what we wanted, what the government wanted. And it was too much for one defence minister who also has to manage operations and uh, engagement with counterparts and is often on the road. Mm. And one of the difficulties about being defence minister is you're often on the road. Mm. And uh, defence ministers get criticised for being uh, out of the country or not available to the media or whatever. But half the time they're, um, they're doing what has now become very common, these two plus twos and three plus threes and so forth, which didn't used to exist until the last sort of 20 years. I mean, there's always been an engagement with the United States, but now we have many of these with Singapore and with Japan and so forth. So now with France, and as a consequence, they have a very busy and hectic schedule. So we didn't want to leave the defence industry part of this massive military build-up, which is quite a sea change to the way we think about uh, Australian industry and Australian defence. Uh, in the hands of one minister who might constantly have to deal with an operational matter. Of course, we were in Afghanistan as well yeah. at that time. So we created the, the cabinet level Ministry of Defence Industry. That's really unusual. I think it's the first and only time we've had two cabinet level ministers running the defence portfolio. And of course, the defence minister was Maurice Payne, who's a mm -hmm. good long term friend of yours. Indeed. But how did you manage this? I mean, was there points where you had clashes with Maurice over who was who in the zoo? I think it worked well because it was me and Maurice, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it might not have worked with different people. It worked with us because we're very good friends. We're housemates in Canberra. Uh, we were president and vice president of the Young Liberals together. Uh, and uh, Malcolm used to describe us as being like Phobos and Deimos, who were the <laughs> mythical uh, horses that drew the chariot of Mars. We were two horses pulling the same chariot. Uh, and. That was a bit of fun, but it distracted the media for a while while they tried to work out what that meant. Uh, it worked because, as Dennis Richardson used to describe it, he'd say that the, the way he described it to his people on Russell Hill was that Maurice will choose the capability that we, we want, that we need. It will be then handed to Christopher on a conveyor belt style um, mental image, who will then produce that capability and at some point in time hand it back to the Minister for Defence, who will then employ it mm -hmm. uh, in operations, uh, wherever, wherever it might be employed. And so it's, it was a conveyor belt. So in that period of the time of deciding the capability to the time of handing it back, that was the job of the Defence Industry Minister to acquire it or build it, whatever we decided to do, either acquire it from overseas or build it here. And that worked perfectly well. Of course, Maurice and I were in constant communication. And there, was, there were obviously tensions between our officers because mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, in politics, people are tribal, but they, were, they weren't between me and Maurice, and we worked very well together. Now, uh, of course, you had been um, a long-term member of parliament. Mm -hmm. You were manager of government business in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had a pretty you know, busy um, uh, portfolio of activities before defence even came in on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Were you expecting defence? Did you want it? Did you lobby for it? I mean, no. how did that come about? Well, I'm a lawyer by trade, so uh, I, I'm a generalist, really, and I'm a politician um, and a message deliverer and a doer. You know, I like to get things done. That's why I ended up with this moniker, the fixer, mm -hmm. because I did actually fix the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme, but it kind of worked because I was often given jobs um, to do. Uh, so education, because Tony Abbott wanted to reform universities and schools and school education, the quality of school education. And then Malcolm wanted to do the National Innovation and Science Agenda when he became Prime Minister, and he gave it to me to do because he knew that I would get it done. Uh, and we did that, I did that for about 10 months and did the National Innovation and Science Agenda in a matter of weeks, really, uh, which was quite transformative. And then 
when the election came and went and Malcolm was thinking about how to get the most out of defence, he realised that you know, I would be a good salesperson for what we were trying to do, but I'd also drive the agenda, mm. which can, as we all know in defence, get bogged down mm. for one reason or another, and keep driving it through sheer force of personality. <laughs> how, did you, did. how did you find the workload, Christopher? I mean, the portfolio is notorious for sort of swamping ministers with paper. Um, so it, was that your experience? Did it bury you? Or when, when did you feel like you were actually in, in control of the agenda? Well, I kept in control of the agenda right from the beginning through a few mechanisms. I never left the APH network in any ministry mm -hmm. because the first thing that everybody does in, in departments is try and get you onto their network so they can look at all your emails. They also try and have access to your calendar so they can fill it with meetings right. or <laughs> visits to far-flung parts of the nation or yeah. the globe. Yeah. Um, and they also try and fill your office with the departmental staff. So the first thing I did was tell Defence I was staying with the APH network, which horrified them, of course. Uh, secondly, I wouldn't allow them to use my, have any access to my calendar or my diary. And thirdly, I, I refused their very generous offers of filling my office with people from Russell Hill. Not because the people from Russell Hill aren't fabulous, and I was often out at Russell Hill as the minister, used my office there more than most ministers had ever done. Mm. But because I had 18,000 public servants on Russell Hill and other parts of the nation, I, I didn't need to have 16 more in my office because um, my office, the, the minister's office, is the political um, layer uh, mm. over the, the bureaucracy. There's no point in having the bureaucracy in the political layer because they have a different uh, outcome, a goal uh, in their minds. They, they are more likely to, to go back to the department at some point. And so they're not going to be thinking, I have to put the government's uh, or, the po or my minister's political career ahead of all the other things, they'll be thinking what's good for the department and potentially my own career. So I therefore had some control right from the very beginning of my daily meter, which I think some ministers lose control and they get overwhelmed, not just in defence in all portfolios, mm. because they don't in, you know, have some of these very simple ways of keeping control of their day. But I was also, um, I'm quite a, I've got a good work ethic if I praise myself. So I would sit down at six o'clock basically every day. I would often come to Canberra in non-sitting weeks and just sit there all day with all my briefs and letters and everything sitting behind me in various folders, which in defence is voluminous, and just work through them. And I would make sure we kept the work rate going mm -hmm. so that Russell Hill could operate and I could operate and the government's agenda was therefore being implemented. So we got a lot done. In fact, we had a record breaking three years of decisions because we kept, between Maurice and I, moving things through. So talking of Russell Hill, uh, you, you had uh, Dennis Richardson was secretary I think yep. for most of your time, uh, Mark Benskin, chief of defence force. Um, you know, these are uh, reasonably tough-minded people, not shy to give <laughs> opinions. How, how did you get on with them? Uh, I mean, did you build a trusting relationship? What was the sort of working relationship like? Uh, well, Dennis was the first secretary that ever swore at me in a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, was, was very refreshing. How quick was that, like day two? It was the first day. Oh, okay. Yes, yep. I said to Dennis, well, if that's the rule, you know, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to, take, to be part of that. Uh, but we're going to have to meet sort of late in the afternoon so we can share a drink mm. and you can swear at me. <laughs> uh, I got along very well with Dennis. Uh, Dennis was not... Greg Moriarty was the secretary for most of my time. Right. Dennis was there for about the first 10 months, I think. Of course, he's a terribly professional public servant. Um, and it was great to have Dennis because he was so experienced as a new minister in the defence portfolio. Uh, and I felt that he was a very safe pair of hands. And Greg Moriarty had been chief of staff in the prime minister's office and, of course, had a very long career in the public service himself. So I was very well served by my secretaries. And one of the first things Dennis said to me was, you will be disappointed in defence. There will be terrible things that will happen because it's the nature of our business uh, that you will you know, have to address. Um, and obviously, Linda Reynolds has had to address the Brereton report, which has been the most mm. um, obviously catastrophic um, issue in the last few years. Um, 
And you want the CDF to be tough-minded people. Mm. I mean, they have to make really important decisions. And I had Angus Campbell, Mark Binskin. I got along well with them all. But I'm not mercurial. I'm very upfront. So I think they found that once they worked out that I wasn't going to be trying to do mercurial Machiavellian actions, they thought, well, he's, what we see is what we get with him. And that's good. Yeah. So we travelled happily together to the Middle East and so forth and enjoyed each other's company and, uh, and made sure that we uh, made good decisions, I think. Well, I want to talk about crises and operations, but let, let's start on the capital equipment front because that was your principal focus for the first defence industry minister job and then you kind of carried that forward yes. into the, into the defence job. Um, how did we end up with the particular choice that was made of the short fin barracuda for the future submarine? Well, we, we involved ourselves in the competitive evaluation process, the CEP, to choose the replacement for the Collins class submarine. Uh, surprisingly, the Swedes weren't asked to be part of the CEP. Uh, that which surprised you? It didn't at the time because yeah. I didn't realise that the Swedes had such a sophisticated right. submarine right. manufacturing um, uh, program. I do now know that, yeah. uh, having been to Sweden since I left politics. Uh, but at the time, I, I didn't really question that. And I didn't initiate the CEP. The CEP was initiated before I came into the portfolio. But uh, Maurice and I sort of then took it over once uh, the 2016 election was, was out of the way. Uh, we ended up with the short fin Barracuda as the base for our Australian design because it was the, it was the model that won the CEP process. Uh, and well, well won it. Um, it was the superior submarine. The, um, the backstory to this, of course, is that the, the, the Abbott government re really went on quite a remarkable journey in its thinking about how to source defence equipment. So they started, yes. this is before your time in the portfolio, they started really talking about offshore acquisition. And we all know, there's no secret that Tony Abbott was, you know, particularly um, uh, caught in the early stages, at least, with the idea of the Japanese uh, Soru class boat to be built in Japan. And then by the time Malcolm Turnbull becomes Prime Minister and you're in the portfolio, we've had this really significant switch of, of um, thinking to say, right, local manufacture is the, uh, is the go. I mean, what's, what's your sort of reflections on that now that you've been out of the portfolio for a while? Was that the right switch? Are you comfortable with it? Do you, th do you think that was a necessary thing? Will, will governments ever change that approach? What, what's your take on that issue? Well, all governments have their own approach. My, um, before um, the policy that you've um, enunciated, our general policy was that we wanted to have the most um, uh, integrated military force with the United States of any other nation in the world. And we, we've largely achieved that. Uh, and 70% of our kit was sourced from the United States. I took the view, and Malcolm took the view, that we wanted to have sovereign capability in Australia, that as the 11th largest economy in the world, as a first world nation, uh, to simply buy all of our equipment from the United States, or 70% of it, uh, wasn't really uh, how a first world nation should think about its future military capabilities. Number one is always capability, and number two needed to be how much of this can we do ourselves so that in the event that we are cut off, for example, from our great allies, we are able to defend ourselves. Mm. And a lot of the thinking around um, uh, building at home has been around sovereign capability. Submarines are the most lethal uh, weapon in the military force, uh, along with the F-35s, arguably, but I think the submarines would be the most lethal. Uh, and so being able to build submarines, design them, build them, put them in the water, maintain them, do full cycle docking is a sovereign capability that we wanted. So eventually we created the Defence Industrial Capability Plan, which enumerated the 10 sovereign industrial capability priorities. Of course, one of those is the, su the sustainment and maintenance of the submarines. Also being able to build platforms, uh, surface platforms, like the Hunter class frigates, the air warfare destroyers, which we've shown that we can do. Yes. Most Australians are quite surprised that we can do that. Yeah. And, uh, one of the important things that we wanted to do is, is create a pride in Australia about our, our, our manufacturing capabilities of really sophisticated pieces of equipment. But the overall strategy was we need to have our own sovereign capabilities in the areas that we think 
uh, we might need them in the future, and submarines was clearly one of those. Mm. And we also had the basis for it because of the Collins class submarine, which had had a very checkered uh, berth, difficult berth, and after all that pain, it seemed unwise to simply not, and uh, having achieved, finally, by the Coles report, the clear um, uh, capability of maintaining and sustaining our submarines ourselves, it seemed odd not to keep going in that direction. I think, uh, if anything, COVID has demonstrated that the sovereign capability That's idea right. is needed much more broadly. That's exactly Australia. right. So I think this we is needed missiles, and I'm very glad that yes. the government has has announced that late last year that yes. uh, the missile capability, because our allies want us to have these capabilities. Yeah. So I'm interested in how governments kind of talk and think their way through these issues. Was was this an outcome that? came about because you spent a lot of time talking with Malcolm Turnbull about it. I mean, how did you actually <laughs> arrive question, at that? That's a good question, actually. You know. Well, the was truth... It, was it sort of so clear from the start you didn't really need to have the conversation? Um, we had lots and lots of conversations around government. I think it's fair to say that I was the most enthusiastic in the NSC and the government generally, the Cabinet, around having an Australian manufacturing capability. Hmm. Being a South Australian, I think, informs that. Um, when the car industry uh, stopped building in Australia, it seemed to me to be a significant blow to our economic capability as a nation, uh, which I don't think is well understood in those parts of the country that it might be financial centres or uh, agricultural centres, for example, because they don't have you know, engineers, mathematicians, physicists, chemists, etc., working in, uh, on the uh, stock market floor in uh, Martin Place, um, but they do mm. in manufacturing. Mm. And first world countries need to have that capability because in the event that we are in a conflagration, and we have been many times in the last 200 years, uh, we need to have those people. And, but to have those people, you have to have jobs for those people. Yes. And once the car industry left, um, I realised, I thought to myself, you know, this is bad because those science, technology, engineering and maths people that we say we need all the time, the rhetoric is very strong. If you don't have jobs for them, they're not going to study those things at university. Mm. And I, I lit upon the course that when I realised I was going to the defence industry, I thought to myself, well, you know, we've got the, bo the bones here if we make the right decisions to completely reinvent our strategic industrial base. To, to meet our national security needs and our industrial capability. And it's, we've got tens of literally $200 billion mm. of, a, of the biggest military capability build up in our nation's history. A, a large part of that can be used to, re, to remake our strategic industrial base. So I set about with all the decisions that I was making to obviously get the, the, the capability that the CDF and Chief of the Army, Navy, Air Force, etc., advised we needed, but how much of that could be done in Australia to build our sovereign industrial capability? And so, whether it was uh, aircraft maintenance and sustainment for the, jo the Joint Strike Fighters, so going to Washington to the JPO, the Joint Project Office there, and trying to win that Asia Pacific work here in Australia, which we largely done, or whether it was the Navy through things like the Hunter class, the offshore patrol vessels, the Pacific patrol boats, the submarines, uh, and the combat reconnaissance vehicles is probably the most classic example for um, the, uh, uh, the Army, but also the, the surface-to-air missile defence system for our forward deployed forces, which would have in the old days simply been bought from Raytheon in the United States and shipped here. Of course, largely, I mean, it is the Raytheon missiles, but they'll, they'll be assembled at Mawson Lakes, giving us a new capability. Mm -hmm. And what that does for the supply chain, Peter, is quite remarkable. And as, I mean, anyone who has now followed defence industry for five years has seen a transformation. Of course people still complain, mm -hmm. because if there's three people tendering, there's one happy person and two unhappy people. We all know that. Of course they complain. They also always say it's not enough. But it's, it has transformed defence industry and by transforming that, it's transforming our manufacturing sector's capability. Yeah. And companies that used to do a little bit of military and 90% civil are now doing 50-50 or more defence. Nye is a classic example because um, 
the money is there to do so. There are now contracts to win. That didn't used to happen in the past. And so we're, there's lots of young people now studying things at university and doing um, you know, uh, doctorates and so forth in things that we are building their intellectual capabilities, which builds our economic capability in Australia. Because mm. not everyone can make a cappuccino on the Gold Coast. You know? <laughs> Much as I love a cappuccino on the, the Gold, Gold Coast, Coast, it doesn't defend the nation. Yeah. You're really describing an ideological sea change inside the Liberal Party, though, Completely. aren't you? Because, I mean, the, the, what was left of the car industry w was wound up under the Abbott government. So was, was it a fight? Were you fighting around the Cabinet table to sort of make this point? I was probably the most dirigiste minister in the Cabinet. <laughs> but I was pushing against an open door because yeah. Malcolm Turnbull could see that vision and it couldn't have been done unless the Prime Minister was on side. I mean, the real battle with the submarines was not um, uh, that it should be built at Adelaide, but that should it be built in Australia. Mm. Because once that decision was made, it was always going to be at Adelaide, because that's where the submarines are built in Australia. So that was a kind of an asinine debate about it, going to South Australia to you know, save my seat or some nonsense. Mm. Mm. I've got a safe seat, by the way, so I'm not sure how that managed to get <laughs> out of the bottle like that. But it was really about doing it in Australia. Yes. And uh, I couldn't see any logic for spending $50 billion in somebody else's economy. Yep. I could see a lot of logic for doing it here. And uh, but there was, it was an ideological change. I mean, you might have forgotten by now, perhaps you haven't, but when SPCR Mona asked for about $20 million or some tiny amount of money, I shouldn't say it's a tiny amount of money, in defence it's a tiny amount of money, mm -hmm. there was a huge debate about it. The Cabinet spent hours discussing you know, whether we should give SPCR Mona $20 million to, to keep employing people in Mildura. And, but by the time we got to 2015-16, you know, we were spending tens of billions of dollars on things that we needed, by the way, not just mm. propping up industries, um, in a way that I don't think would have happened two or three years before that, yeah. I must say. Well, but it was an ideological shift. Yeah, yeah. But then defence is different. Yes. Because there's only one customer. And a lot of people don't understand defence. They sort of treat it like it's just another part of the manufacturing economy. It isn't. It's about our national security. security. And there's only one customer. Mm. So it's, a, it's not like every other part of the economy. And Russell Hill is, you know, like, it's a, it's, I wouldn't say it's the third arm of government because it's not constitutionally, but it's, it does have to march to its own beat to an extent because it, it's, it doesn't matter who's in government. Mm. They have to keep defending the country. Let's, let's sort of move to uh, the Defence Minister role proper. So now, you, now you're running the entire value chain, and that includes our international relationships, it includes military operations. Um, what, were you, what struck you about the, the two jobs that was different when you got into the, the job replacing Maurice, who went to become foreign minister? What, what was the sort of menu of things that you had to concentrate on as you, as you started that role? Well, it wasn't dramatically different in my mind um, about what my job was, because my job in defence industry was to produce the best capability to make sure that our servicemen and women won in the field and came home in one piece. That was the, that was the, the gig, really. Um, and that remained the case as Defence Minister, but obviously you picked up a great deal of the operational aspects and knowledge and the travel and the engagement with counterparts. Um, and so you do, you do move to a different plane because when you do go around to Afghanistan or the Emirates and visit our bases there or Iraq and so forth and see it, the service men and women, it does really bring home to you how important that job is mm. in a way that defence industry, although I did a lot of that travelling as well because um, you know, I, I, think, I thought it was important um, to actually be out in the field as much as possible. Um, and there's a kind of a role of keeping the servicemen and women knowing that the country appreciates them. Really, when you important. saw the Afghanistan situation, I mean, we, we were in the business of uh, really moving more into training than the hard kinetic fight that had been down in Aruzgan province. But what, what was your reaction to that? Did you feel confident that Australia was on the right course in Afghanistan? Did, did you think it was time for us to start perhaps reducing our equities? I mean, how, how did you feel about that? Well, I'm a student of history and uh, I 
was an enthusiast for uh, defeating the Taliban in Afghanistan and removing the terrorist threat that led to the uh, Twin Towers being destroyed. Um, and I, the role of the military, unfortunately, is to keep the peace, and that means they often have to take part in conflagrations. So I don't have a misty-eyed view of um, we shouldn't be in wars. I think that sometimes you know, wars are an extension of government policy or foreign policy or diplomacy, as class of it said, and we have to be strong. Mm. So Australians should be very proud of our military capabilities, by the way. Often they don't and even know that they exist. It always surprises me. Mm. The really ignorant things that people say about our defence capabilities in Australia, it's kind of stunning especially, and I knew that before I was in the portfolio, but especially when you've been in the portfolio. So I, um, I wasn't enthusiastic about withdrawing from Afghanistan, but I thought if the I'll take the advice, of course, of the Chief of the Defence Force and, and where our priorities should be, and I do agree that our priorities should be in our region of influence here in the Indian Ocean across to the Pacific and up into Asia. So I do, I do think that Doubt, doubt, not downgrading, but reducing our involvement in places like Somalia, the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, is inevitable. Yeah. I don't think we should uh, withdraw from the region because I think we have two very good bases in the Emirates that do have, are very important to us. Getting them, have, have, having them renewed if we re left would be hard yes, yes. because it's hard for any country to say that you know, they'd like to host Australians or Americans or anybody else. So they're important assets. And we are a first world country. We're, we have the same size economy as Russia. Mm. And so our job is to be part of the Western um, alliance, the broader Five Eyes, NATO view of trying to make the world a better place. So I do think we have an important role in being in those, those uh, unfortunate wars that come every now and then. Speaking of the alliance, what was it like uh, from a defence perspective dealing with the Trump administration? <laughs> Great question. Uh, look, it was a bit of a roller coaster ride, and uh, I think when President Trump was elected, we all kind of um, held our collective breath. I think we handled it well, though, by the way. I think Malcolm handled it well, and Scott Morrison's handled, handled, handled it very well. I think the Trump administration got a little crazier as it went along. Um, I read um, The Room Where It Happened just before the American election. And I, I, was, I wish I hadn't read it. It's like seeing The Conjuring, mm. you know. I wish I hadn't seen The Conjuring. <laughs> and I thought, goodness gracious, if only we'd known that was going on when we were making all these decisions. It was, I mean, it was a very unusual policy process in the White House. Yes. Uh, that's to put it mildly. Um, unorthodox, I think, is the way we've all ended up describing it. But I think everyone knows what we mean. Uh, but Jim Mattis was fantastic. So I was lucky in that respect. Um, uh, and he was, the minute, he was the secretary for most of the time that I was in the defence portfolio. And it was a terribly sad day when he decided he wasn't mm. going to be able to do it anymore. Mm. But I fully understand, you know, he got to that point where he felt that President Trump didn't value allies, which is terrifying for you know, the US's allies, yeah. of which we are clearly one. Yeah. Uh, but I think the Pentagon and um, the defence establishment in Washington, people like Jim Mattis just thought, right, well, our job is to keep doing exactly what I said before, keep doing what we were doing before, which is securing the nation, protecting the people and implementing our policies around the world. And to be fair to President Trump, he wasn't as bad at foreign policy and defence as he was at handling the coronavirus, for example, mm. or his treatment of political opponents. And he only really, I think, dropped off the cliff when he treated the Kurds the way he did. And that was the moment that I thought, no, you know, really, that's kind of the end. But I think I'd left by that stage. Yes. Um, but I thought, well, you know, to say, what have the Kurds ever done for us, you know? Um, it was a terrifying moment for anybody who's ever stood with the United States. So so I thought, he doesn't really get it. Yes. And having read John Bolton's book, I realised that he now just regarded foreign defence policies like a real estate deal. Mm -hmm. 
and thought he was just dealing with a tricky customer yeah. in North Korea yeah. or Iran. Well, and who, who <laughs> could forget the, the video he made for Kim Jong-un, which sort of suggested that, you know, if only the North would give up its nuclear weapons, there was real estate development on, on its coast that, you know, was, was the future no, of the terrifying. country. terrifying. Yeah. But that's democracy, and democracy's had its say. Yes. So, you know, we have a new president, and I think Joe Biden will be much more orthodox. The, the, the other side of the coin is, of course, China. And, and you were uh, in government at a time when we were beginning to, I, I think, see more the risky side than the opportunity side of engagement with China. What's your sort of recollections of that story and how it, how it played in the NSC and, and how senior ministers such as yourself sort of thought about what it was that we were actually having to deal with? Well, I can't speak for the government on its policies to do with China because I've retired from politics. I can only tell you what my views are about how we manage the Chinese relationship. I was one of the very first um, ministers into China after quite a long period of time. You might remember there was a sort of 18-month period where ministers weren't visiting China, mm. not because we didn't want to go, but because we weren't being encouraged to apply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to put it nicely, I, um, I said to, um, I think Frances Adamson was the secretary, I said, I think I'd like to go. Um, she was the foreign secretary, not the defence department. So I did go. Um, and it was a terrific visit. And they were very, you know, decent as they um, always are, actually, in their treatment of people. Um, unless you're, um, well, the ministers are not very decent in their treatment of the Uyghurs and, and other malcontents that they don't appreciate, which has been on full display in Hong Kong in the last since I mm. left politics, which is terribly tragic. Mm. Now, my view of China is that um, it has every right to expect to be a world power, one of the two world powers. And adopting kind of a Western lens and saying, why is China stretching and flexing its muscles in the Asia Pacific? Why can't they just get along with everyone? And why can't they just trade with us? And why do they want to have, you know, all this military capability? Is missing the point. China has been a world power for thousands of years, long before the United States was the world power. And there's only two real world powers, and that's China and the United States. So the first thing you ought to do is accept that China has every right to expect to be one of the two great powers. And a lot of Westerners still haven't got to that point. Um, and a lot of Westerners, I, said, I think, still completely misunderstand the hundred years of humiliation. You know, it's kind of like, why can't they just get over it? Mm. Well, they're not going to just get over the hundred years of humiliation. Because the Europeans treated, and not just the Europeans, treated China abysmally from the Opium Wars, the end of the Opium Wars, and during the Opium Wars, right through to the end of the Second World War. Uh, it was a long period, 120, 130 years of the Chinese being treated really um, as third, fourth class citizens, as, as barbarians, when they really regarded the people who were treating that way as the barbarians. Mm. So you have to understand the history of China to understand their current state of, of mind. And I think we have to do that first, and then we have to convince, we have to th get our mind in the right space first, and then we have to convince China that uh, the international world order that we have now, since the Second World War, has been the driving force for their prosperity and will continue to be. And the alternative is not good for China. Mm. A breaking up of the world into cantons, for want of a better description, to use a Chinese word, is, um, is bad for China's economy. And they are a trading nation and they're a mercantile people. I think the current um, the tensions with China will pass. They always do. Um, it's in our interest and China's interest for them to pass. But it's very important that Australia doesn't, um, uh, isn't seen to and doesn't in reality uh, change its sails to suit the prevailing winds of the Chinese relationship. It's very important that China knows that we will not um, simply agree that somehow we've been bad or that their list of, of grievances is, is genuine. Um, they mustn't continue to uh, militarise the South China Sea. Um, they don't have um, international rights to, uh, to do so. We've been very clear about that, and we have to continue to be clear about that. 
And uh, while that will cause continuing tensions, as it did when I was in the portfolio, now we don't recognise their, their um, sovereignty over the South China Sea. Mm. And we have a different wording for that, which when I was in government I used to use, of course, which is we didn't recognise anybody's um, sovereignty over the South China Sea we regard as international waters, but we have to keep proving that international waters, and that's yes. going to keep creating tensions. Yeah. And there are other tensions in the Taiwan relationship, as I've written about in my column, is, is really, I think, one of the most serious points of, of tension in the whole of the world right now. Would you agree that most of the big investment decisions that you drove for defence ultimately is all about a concern about China? No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, it's an attempt to set, get me to say something very controversial, Peter. Uh, it's no, not I, about defending <laughs> ourselves against Indonesia, is it? Uh, well, we have a, uh, uh, many documents that we've published from the white paper right through to the last year's force structure review and so forth that outlines that we have um, concerns around uh, security across the, our part of the, the globe, from the Antarctica right through to North Asia. Uh, and uh, the South Pacific and, of course, to the Indian Ocean. There are many different threats, um, and there are many other countries that are building their military capabilities, not just China. Uh, but obviously we are viewing with interest China's um, expansion of their ports capabilities across to places like the Middle East and Sri Lanka, potentially Pakistan. I think most people are admitting now that there is a Chinese port in Pakistan. Um, these things are of concern to us, mm. and our force structure review and how we plan our capabilities are clearly designed to protect our air and naval um, reaches, and, uh, and they should continue to do so. What, um, for you, was the high point of your time in, in the two related ministries, Christopher? <laughs> what do you look back on with sort of greatest satisfaction? Well, I think I did move the dial on the uh, strategic industrial base. And I think those three years were a sea change, which is going to be hard to reverse, mm. uh, in how we view our sovereign capability. Um, the highlight to me was bringing defence along with me on that project, because a lot of people in defence, of course, didn't necessarily want to. Uh, do that sovereign and capability piece. They had been very used to um, the US-Australia nexus, which is fine, and we haven't broken that nexus, but they were very used to say, of saying, well, if it's, you know, if it's a Raytheon missile, it's got to be the best. I can't get into trouble for buying that. And there wasn't a sense that we needed uh, that fundamental input to capability, which defence industry has become, mm -hmm. which is a big change. That was a mm -hmm. big change. Mm -hmm. So I think... The two highlights for me in the defence portfolio was definitely moving the dial on our sovereign capability in defence industry and knowing the impact that will have across our economy for decades to come. It was very important to our nation. But secondly, just serving the men and women of the defence force who serve us, you know, being their yeah. advocate in, ca in cabinet, in the NSC, and always keeping uppermost in our mind, are they safe, can we bring them home? Uh, let's look at the other side. It's a great of the privilege point. to be the Minister for Defence. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And different to other parliamentary jobs, right? I mean, I yeah, think most people different. would say other, other, other portfolios can be very demanding, very hardworking, but there is yeah. something qualitatively different to the defence. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's easily the best portfolio I've ever had. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's no state governments involved. <laughs> so you don't have a, a ministerial council. Yes. Yes. who are trying to stop you doing anything all the time. So that was the problem in education. You know, sometimes you felt that going to the state education and territory and federal ministers meeting was like you know, going into the Colosseum because nobody seemed to want to actually have any outcomes from it except fighting. Right. I mean, right. the most exciting thing seemed to be the press conference after every state minister's meeting <laughs> where they just bag the Commonwealth government. You'd think, <laughs> this is really a bit um, asinine. <laughs> But uh, in defence, of course, you don't have to do that. Yes. And foreign affairs is very similar. Um, so that's, that's the high side. Uh, uh, but, you know, you, you made the comment that uh, Dennis said to you early on, look, we'll, we'll visit disappointments on you. Yes. I mean, w w failures 
problems, um, things that you were unhappy about as you look back on it? Would, would you have done things differently in any area? Or? I wish I'd resolved the full cycle docking issue around the Collins class submarine. Right. I know it's quite specific, <laughs> but it, you know, it was a. Yeah. I left just before that was resolved, right? And um, I do feel like I wish I'd resolved that. Um, <laughs> so that is a regret. I know it's a very specific one. I was never, I'm not really a person who sort of has regrets uh, or feels disappointments. Um, I sort of leave, hopefully make a difference and leave things um, with some sense of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say <laughs> the things you'd have done differently, there's decisions I'd like to have made that I didn't make. Like full cycle docking on the Collins would have solved, saved everybody a lot of hassles because it's still, still being kicked around now as we know and it's February. 2021 mm. and I left I announced I was leaving I think in March 2019 so but it wasn't re well, it wasn't ready to be resolved to be frank but um, so I couldn't resolve it but I would like to have resolved that um, I probably would have liked to have resolved the Brereton report before I left as well because it's uh, it was allowed to well it wasn't allowed to it, it went on for a long time because of the nature of the the role, but it went on for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was debilitating for a lot of people. Mm. Um, I'd like to do, I would like to have done more for uh, veterans who feel that they have been let down by defence from a mental health point of view. Um, there's always those issues that go on and every minister, you know, will continue to deal with them. Well, what advice would you have for someone that, that comes into the portfolio now, no, knowing what you know now, uh, if, if you were to meet the next defence minister, what would you say to them should be how they should approach the job? Get control of the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and never let it go. Right. Uh, and don't allow yourself to be so busy that you can't make decisions. Uh, because I think there is a danger in the Westminster system that you can be so busy that you're not actually getting anything done. You know what I mean? You're busy doing a lot of things that are useful, but who's making the decisions? I think it's good for the study to tease out a little bit this idea of control the agenda. How, right. how do you do that? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, when I say control the agenda, know that you're the decision maker. Um, if you get a recommendation from the department or a brief from the department that you don't agree with, you don't have to agree with it. Mm, mm. <laughs> you can send it back. Uh, it has crept into um, our system of government at state, federal and territory level, this sense that if a minister doesn't agree with their department somehow, the media says that the minister must be wrong. Actually, it's the minister's job to make the decisions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's the department's job to make the recommendations. But it's not about the minister's job to be a cipher for the recommendation. There is a bit of a government um, trope, though, in saying, well, we're following military advice, right? Which is Military often advice is a shelter. bit different. Don't I mean, you, you wouldn't want a situation where, you know, the, the Minister for Defence was telling the Chief of the Defence Force that we should, you know, put our military capability here rather than there. Yeah, yeah. Or... Um, I think you should, you know, land on that spot, not this spot. You don't want to, you don't want, or have we got our submarines in the right theatre? Perhaps we should try them in Tasmania or something. You don't want the Minister for Defence interfering on operations right. at all, I think. Right. That would be very wrong. Uh, and similarly, you don't want the department, the bureaucracy, thinking that they're the decision maker. You want the Russell Hill to think, you know, it's our job to give the Minister the best possible advice and it's his or her job to make the decision. And when I say control the agenda, I think from the beginning, you need the department to know that we are all partners, that you're not a cipher. If they want a cipher, they can you know, buy a performing dog. Um, you are the decision maker, mm -hmm. and you're going to be the decision maker, and you want to work with them very closely, but you're you're going to question decisions and you're going to send, you might send them back. I mean, I, I didn't send a lot of recommendation uh, briefs back, but I had a lot of conversations with my secretaries and the, and I would often ring people in Russell Hill who were on the bottom of the brief, mm, mm, <laughs> which used to give them quite a shock. Mm. Um, in fact, I think in my book, I describe how I, I gave Tim Barrett some suggestions about naming the submarines. <laughs> 
which he didn't take Would very kindly much to. Much appreciated. It yeah. wasn't very much appreciated, no, actually. No. And uh, so I said to him, well, who, makes, who gives you these recommendations? And he said, um, a, a guy in the history division or whatever they call it, I got it. I said, can I have his name <laughs> and phone number? And I got an email from Tim saying this is his name and phone number. I rang him. I said, I've got some suggestions for the Collins class, sub for the new, the new submarines. Anyway, I didn't get my way. And, um, it was and too <laughs> early for the pine, I think. That's just I not... I wanted to call it the, uh, the Hubert Wilkins class. Okay. Hubert Wilkins class <laughs> doesn't sound as threatening as the attack class. I think I'm on Navy's side, <laughs> to be honest. Right. I am too, actually. I said to Tim, oh, that's a much better choice, the attack class. <laughs> He said, well, I don't think people would have been too frightened of the Hubert coming at them. I said, no, no, I think you're right. So my, my last question for you is, you, you're one of uh, not many people in the portfolio that have actually managed to pick your own time of departure. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think defence has almost become a bit mythological in that it is a sort of a, usually brings a disastrous end to someone's I know, I know, it's shocking, career. isn't it? <laughs> You, it's a you real kind of, graveyard. You, you, you left when you wanted to. So how, did. how did you come to that point? Was it a tough decision when you, when you made it? Well, it was hard to leave the best portfolio in the government. That's true. Mm. Um, being the leader of the House, being the Minister for Defence, puts you at the centre of everything. You're on the leadership group. You run the parliament. You're on the NSC, obviously in the cabinet. Um, and you're in that small clutch of ministers who, you know, if something really important is happening... Um, to the nation, you know, you're going to be consulted about it. So it's very exhilarating. Mm. But I thought, you know, at 51, I'd been in politics longer than I hadn't been. <laughs> and I thought, if I'm going to have a third career, I need to go now. Otherwise, I'll be here for the rest of my life. Mm. Mm. And I'll wake up one day and thought, think that wasn't very imaginative. There's also a real lure to leaving on top. Yes. And it doesn't happen very often. Most people don't do it. Yeah. They unfortunately wait just that bit too long. Like that one extra question the barrister asks that they wish they hadn't asked and ruins the entire case. Right. So you actually have to know when to go. Yeah. And uh, I thought, well, I've had a great run. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, it's time to see what else is out there. Otherwise, I'll, I'll regret it. And I think I would have regretted it. But mm. I love being out of politics. I mean, I loved being in politics, but I, I'm delighted to be out of it as well. Yeah. Christopher, thank you so much for talking to us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you.